plane ticket from Chicago to Baltimore to uh, <laughs> fly over. Uh, I supremely appreciate everyone. Uh, I am humbled that people are still doing this competition this year. Uh, yeah, sorry. That is a good point. Um, I am Michael Newman. Uh, I've, I did the competition uh, for the four years I was in high school. Uh, it propelled me on a path of going to University of Maryland, uh, focusing in structures. Uh, I graduated with uh, a bachelor's in civil engineering, went on, got a structural degree at Hopkins while I was working full time. Uh, and I've been working on bridges professionally for the last about eight years. Uh, I started, I got reinvolved with this program. Uh, you can see our wonderful sponsors and thank you a particular shout out to uh, Mandy with Marine Solutions. Uh, she was running the competition uh, and we were co-workers and she, I recognized you from five years ago when you were doing this competition, you should help out. Uh, and then I've become more involved with the competition over the years and now I'm helping to run it. And thank you to everyone uh, physically in the uh, Baltimore Museum of Industry uh, that is helping today. Uh, and thank you for everyone joining online. Thank you for the students. Uh, everyone was able to show up to their spec. Uh, we were able to talk about individual bridges with each person. Uh, I appreciate everyone taking their time today. Um, so thank you. And without delaying uh, anymore, I'll turn it over to the people physically at the competition. Um, and if you want, I'll try to patrol the chat and try to answer any questions you might have that are semi-related. Uh, but I'll hand it over to Dr. Sangri uh, and what's going to happen with the competition itself. <laughs> Yay! Hi, thanks, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I'll echo Michael's welcome to um, our annual Maryland Woodbridge Challenge uh, coming to you live from the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Um, my name is Rachel Sangri. I teach in the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering at Johns Hopkins. Um, up the road, and I have the distinct pleasure today of breaking these bridges that you have all put so much hard work uh, and effort and time into building. Um, so why are we testing? Why are we breaking these beautiful bridges? Um, really, there are two reasons. One is to determine the ultimate strength um, of the bridges. That's going to help us determine the efficiency of your bridges, right? The, the strength to weight ratio. Uh, which is uh, uh, really the primary goal here, uh, to have a um, high strength to weight ratio. Um, and two is really to study the behavior of your bridges under load. Um, as that load is being continuously increased um, by our testing frame here. So as we load the bridge, you're going to see plotted in real time um, a load displacement curve. Here. All right, so we have load on the y-axis and displacement on the x-axis. Um, and so uh, there are different ways we can, we can perform this type of test and plot this type of curve. Uh, one way is to have um, a bridge that we apply increasingly higher amounts of load to, and we measure the displacement under those um, weights. The other way is to uh, apply um, at a constant rate a displacement or a deflection to your bridge, so pull down on your bridge, and at the same time measure the corresponding load that your bridge is resisting um, as it is deflecting downward. And that's the way that we're going to do it today. This is called a displacement control test. Um, it's a bit safer and easier to control, um, and so that's why we're going to do that. So. Um, before we begin, I just want to give you an example of what this is going to look like if you haven't done this before. Um, and to use an example, I'm going to use a piece of plywood that's here. Uh, this is where your bridge will go. Um, and this piece of plywood is much different than your truss bridges, right? Because it is a solid piece of wood. It's very heavy. Um, and so it's not going to win in terms of efficiency. It's not 
Um, it, it has much more material than it actually needs. But for our purposes, because I don't want to break one of your bridges as a sample, um, we're going to use this to test this out. All right, so once your bridge is in place, and I'll carefully put it in place, put this, um, put a, a loading plate that is 40 uh, millimeters square um, onto the loading plane, put this wing nut on top here to secure that plate, um, and then I'm going to start the test. So when I start the test, I'm going to pull this switch over here um, in the down position, and that's going to pull this threaded rod down, and with it will come your switch. And what you're going to see Start. I put a little bit of load in there to, to start, so um, you can see that that's captured. So even if I begin the test by tightening the wing nut down a little too much on your bridge, that initial load will be captured, so don't worry about that. So now I'm going to start this. And you'll see in most bridges um, a very distinct a uh, relatively linear portion of the load displacement curve at the beginning. Um, and this is really where our bridges are primarily operating. So, so when you're driving over a bridge, um, this is the region of the curve that you are, uh, that the bridge is behaving in. Um, it's, it's linear, uh, there's no failure, there's no breaks. Um, and actually, if I took the load off of this, this piece of plywood, um, you would see that it tracks that initial curve back down towards uh, zero load and zero displacement. That's what we want. But today, we're gonna test your bridges past that elastic, what we call elastic region of the curve, um, into a region where we're going to see all sorts of little um, hops and skips and jumps in this, in this plot. Um, and those hops and skips and jumps are going to indicate where your bridge is experiencing localized failure. So where a little stick has snapped. Um, and that will help us to um, sort of see different things um, going on in the bridge, and, we'll, and we should be able to hear them at the same time. So if you hear a little snap, you should see a little jump um, in, in the curve. Um, one of the things that this tells us is, is something about load path and redundancy. So you probably all designed your bridges to have a particular uh, path that the load would take to get to the supports. Um, but a lot of bridges have alternate load paths. They have some redundancy. Um, and so when one part of your initial load path breaks or fails, your load will actually identify a secondary load path to get down to the support. And that's a great thing, right? Because if there is some failure on a bridge, we want to have some um, alternate load path so that everybody can get off safely. So keep an eye out for those things um, as we test your bridges. and. With that, I will unload this plywood and we will get started on bridge one. And I typed it in the chat, but feel free, the suggested view is gallery side by side. So that way you can see three screens, the three cameras, as well as the test screen. Uh, I've been testing out the swapped share screen with video because that just gives a nice big video but uh, if you want to see the whole thing, at least for me, uh, the show thumbnail video on the side, uh, but gallery side by side, I've been messing around with my camera view. And again, this is optimized for computers. So you should still be fine on mobile, but uh, you'll probably get the best view on a computer. Uh, and feel free if you have uh, messages to type or ask, feel free to go in the channel, the chat. And also, if uh, your fellow classmates or whoever are confused of, I'm, I'm on uh, one video and it seems closed, they might be on the, uh, the spec when we were on that uh, spec channel and not over on the webinar or everyone can hopefully see we are live on facebook um on the uh people could correct me if i was wrong uh jessica but i believe we're on the baltimore museum of industry facebook page but uh we have this first bridge and can we confirm 
who's being tested first and all that. Michael, we absolutely can. Um, just for everyone to know, the Facebook, we are live on Facebook, but the views are not cooperating with us. We can, um, we're not able to see all the camera angles. So uh, Zoom's definitely the place to be and we'll get started with our first one shortly. <laughs> so in case you're wondering, wondering what we're doing up here, um, we have uh, our loading plate that actually goes on the loading plane of your bridge. Um, and then we have this special um, uh, uh, nut that kind of, it just takes up a lot of space. And so it makes putting this wing nut on just a little bit uh, quicker and easier. But um, I dropped it. So <laughs> uh, we're, gonna, we're just gonna deal with this wing nut. It'll take us a little time to, to scroll this guy down, but it'll be fine. So our first bridge, is um, from Andrea and uh, at Hereford High School in um, in Baltimore County. And Andrea, um, this is her bridge. Um, it it looks um, to me. I would call it the frat truck. So uh, two parallel cords here. These horizontal members are cords, and then um, diagonal members that are kind of pointed into the center of the bridge this way. Um, which um, under this loading condition will put most of those diagonals in tension. So we're going to place it here. All right, uh, we're going to put the plate down. onto the floor system. And we will scroll the wing nut down. I was not going to go wearing my safety glasses for the plywood test because I knew I wasn't testing it to failure, but these little sticks have a tendency to go flying. So put my glasses on. And reset our displacement. I just have a tiny bit of load in there. All right. So, Andrea, I hope you're ready. We're going to hit start here on the computer and uh, begin the loading. All right, so you have a really nice floor system um, that's getting the load to the to the trusses. Um, you see a little bit of failure, and I believe that's the diagonal members separating from uh, the lower cord. Oh, no, actually, it's the upper cord. But that load is finding lots of alternate load paths, lots of different ways to go. And the truss in the back here, uh, the diagonals and the verticals did not separate from the cord. But I don't know if you can see that in, in uh, one of these cameras here, but the top cord did uh, appear to buckle. Um, and so that top cord is just one single piece of wood, um, and it's in compression. And so you can imagine trying to push on that one single piece of wood. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't have a lot of strength. And now we've got some um, failure in the back, where the diagonals and the verticals are separating from the lower cord, so it's a little more symmetric. And we're going to take this out to uh, three centimeters. It is. It's uh, the load is mostly being carried on that lower cord, which is substantial. I think it might be. Uh, two pieces that are glued together, so that's great. All right, awesome. So maximum load is 63.48 newtons. Fantastic. Um, one thing I really liked about Andrea's bridge was it had a lot of uh, cross bracing. Um, in it, a lot of lateral bracing. And that kept the loading really even. Um, so, so some bridges, if they don't have, let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, 
So there's a lot of cross bracing here in the top plane, um, not not in the bottom plane, um, but in the top plane. And then also, actually, Andrea had it uh, this way. So like, if you're driving through the bridge, that might be a bit of an obstruction, but um, but it does really help um, to keep the keep the loading aligned as you're pulling down here. Um, and so so that was really nice. If you if you didn't have that, sometimes you'll see. Um, a lot of out of plane, we call it, displacement. So you would see, even though the truss was being loaded this way, um, you would see displacement this way. Um, and this helps a lot to prevent that. So good job. And we have bridge number two. This is uh, Ethan's bridge. Also from Hereford High School. Let me reset our clock here. So Ethan's Bridge um, is an arch, and that's beautiful. I wonder, um, I didn't get the chance to talk with Ethan earlier, but I wonder if he soaked the wood to get that really nice um, curve. Uh, but it's, it's a, a laminated arch, so it's actually two pieces of um, basswood glued together, um, and then this sort of uh, radial pattern of, um, of braces connecting the lower cord up to the arch here. So beautiful design. Loading plate six. Tighten down the wing nut. Also, some really strong uh, floor beams. Floor beams are the members that are connecting the two trusses and that the loading plate is directly sitting on. Uh, so it's important that those are strong so that the load can actually get over to um, the, the trusses here or the arches, whatever we want to call them in this case, um, really carry the load. I always find it uh, pretty sad when the floor beams break and you're left with just a beautiful, beautiful trusses, beautiful main members, but it just can't be tested all the way. Those make me very sad. It's true, and it's, it's very common. So if you do end up having one of those bridges that we test today, do not feel alone. Um, you'll just know better next time. Um, the good thing about those cases is that you can rebuild really easily because you still have your trusses in. Woo! Yeah, uh, my ninth grade competition, uh, it was focused on having a very low, uh, low profile. We couldn't have much height and having it underneath. And for some reason or another, uh, or you could build really high like this arch and everyone who went high, like a high arch, um, all of them just broke through the base. And it was just a really sad competition day of many people uh, failing through that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the height of your of your truss really influences how much load is going into these members. So the taller, um, if you can keep it stable enough and keep the individual members strong enough, the taller it is, the less load you've got, uh, the smaller the forces we have going into these members. So that can make your truss really strong, but then your floor system has got to keep up with that strength. All right, so Ethan, we are ready to test your bridge. All right, 
We are load sharing, correct? Or load sharing, screen sharing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, so the four beams are doing a really good job. That's a nice, stiff response. Um, and we've got this, this arch, which is definitely in compression. It's starting to buckle. Um, and actually, the arch didn't buckle, but it was just displacing so much laterally, which you can probably see in, in this uh, view above, um, that these pieces, your cross bracing, came unglued. So it's trying to figure out how do I get this load over to the abutment safely so people can get off this bridge, um, but it's definitely not doing it the way you originally intended at this point. The lower cord here has now failed. But it's still chugging along, so we'll keep loading up to three centimeters. And it's a remarkable amount of flexibility in this arch that has not yet failed. The lower cord has also failed um, on the other on the other side. And it's really loading the uh, arches sideways at this point, and we are finished. All right, good job, Ethan. That's great. 110.78 newtons um, and I think probably when I unload this it would, as the bridge is loaded it's probably the most remarkable view in terms of the F curve here we have um, in the lateral displacement and um, when I unload it it will probably come back a little more vertical because those arches didn't fail but the lower cords um, yeah to get the wing nut off there. All right. Um, yeah, so I don't think you can reuse this guy, um, but, but that was great. Um, I think if you had had, you could have gotten a little bit more load out of it if you'd had maybe a little more cross bracing, because um, that would have kept that lateral uh, movement in check. Um, but that was really well done. Good job. Before we get to our next bridge, which is Josh's from Rockbridge Academy, um, I'm just going to reposition the machine here. So when we pull down on this rod for multiple tests in a row, it just keeps on moving down. So eventually we have to put it back up. Unfortunately, the motor works just as slowly going up as it does going down. So kind of 
taking the time it took to test, but in reverse here. In the meantime, might I say thank you to our wonderful sponsors. Everyone, uh, so we will be awarding, we have five awards so far, uh, or we will be giving five awards today. There will be a first, second, and third. And these will be uh, cash prizes. We will send out checks. We'll be in coordination with people. So first, second, and third, as well as an architectural excellence award, which we'll be judging as a group uh, with Nicole as the head, as she stated, she wanted to be more impactful this year. Um, and then we'll also have a uh, mentor award for uh, mentor of the year. Uh, so those will be the five awards and thank you to our wonderful, uh, wonderful sponsors. Um, we have, of course, Baltimore Museum of Industry, uh, Wallace Montgomery, Marine Solutions, ASCE, the Society, check out American Society of Civil Engineers. Oh, yeah, thank you. That is wonderful to have. Uh, our wonderful groups, uh, KCI and Hope. Hope you're, so thank you to all of our wonderful sponsors. Uh, and we will have, once we're done testing all the bridges, we'll have a break for us to reorganize, um, to check to make sure everything's right. And then we will uh, come back for the awards, which we'll be in contact with people uh, afterwards for sending out said awards. Uh, uh, Dr. Sangria, are we good to go for the next thing? Yeah. And so this, again, this is Josh Bridge from Rockbridge Academy. Um, and Josh, you have a, um, I don't know if you had a, a, a particular design in mind for this, but I would say this is something close to a Warren truss, which is one of the easier trusses to remember because it has a W for Warren in its pattern. Um, and what that means is that you've got a combination of um, diagonal members here that are going to be in tension and some that are going to be in compression. Um, let's see, and your diagonal members on the end are doubled up, which was a great idea because that those take uh, more, more load than the interior ones. Um, and actually your uh, bottom and top cores are quadrupled. So that's, a, that's a, was a pretty large cross section. Um, and yeah, let's, let's see how this guy goes. room here so I'm just making sure that your uh, supports are evenly on um, on the two abutments here or the ends of your truss are evenly on the two supports here rather um, and the diagonals are coming pretty close to loading here so that looks good All right, so you can see I've already put in almost five newtons there, but it's capturing that, so you'll get credit for that five newtons. And I'm going to uh, start the loading now. Uh, looks pretty well connected here, but just to be safe. My glasses on, all right. All right, nice initial uh, linear response. Pretty even deformation here. Wow, it's a one, 160 Newtons, awesome. And it's just got a nice uh, level off there a bit. Let's see if I can tell what's failing. Yeah, 
actually tell. I think it's probably the diagonal separating from the uh, cords, but it is hard to see. You don't have a lot of lateral bracing, but the fact that you're loading the uh, top cord there um, is providing um, lateral bracing and it's, it's providing a really nice uniform loading to this. So um, not seeing really any out of plane movement. See, I can see a diagonal separated from the cord there, um, but this is doing a really good job holding on to that load. All the way out to three centimeters. Awesome. All right. Good job. So 160.3 newtons was the was the ultimate load. And it still has quite a bit of load in it, so I'm actually going to raise the rod before trying to loosen up the wing nut here, uh, so I don't think I'd have much luck. You can see it's got a little permanent deflection in there, but actually um, came pretty close to, uh, to where it started. Let's see if I can see what actually failed. Yep. See at least one diagonal that's separated um, from the cords. But, but basically this held together really well. Um, so your connections were strong. Um, there's a little excess glue on your connections, which you could probably trim off with an exacto knife or something. But in this case, I think um, I don't know. I don't know if I'd recommend to change anything because it did pretty well. So good job. And we have bridge number four. Um, this is Alex from Lee for Future Academy. Awesome. All right, so Alex, I'd say this is another Warren type truss, so I can see the W's in here. Um, and yeah, all right. You got um, a nice floor system, a lot of cross bracing here. Um, the one thing we'll see, we'll see how your floor system does. Um, it's connected underneath the lower core here. So here's the lower cord, and then the floor system is, is glued underneath it. Um, sometimes that can be a little problematic, as we were talking about in the beginning, because um, that floor system can, instead of sitting on top of the cord, when it's below, it's really dependent on that glue joint. Um, so it's, it's possible that that can, that can be the thing that initiates failure, but, but let's see. As a note, uh, I believe this is an unofficial entry. Uh, there was, I forget which part of specs, uh, but I believe it was a part of the loading portion, which uh, is definitely the hardest place uh, to succeed or to pass qualifications. Uh, 
Uh, but it will still be tested, and I'm I'm excited to find out uh, how failure looks for it. Yeah, you know, it's just it's great that you all um, participated this year. Um, you know, you don't learn unless you build something and try it out and see how it fails, so that you can grow from that. Um, so, you know, whatever the takeaway is from this um, competition today, just you know, let it be some increased knowledge and in, uh, in how bridges are constructed and how we can make them stronger. And my uh, email is available on the Baltimore Museum of Industry website. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, oh, um, I guess this will be for some other announcement. Uh, I, I guess I'll give information near the end. But if people are interested in uh, picking up their bridges, I believe somebody had uh, that question or another. Uh, I uh, love holding on i still have my bridges from high school um so if you want to pick it up that can be organized later uh and my email is available if you want to uh communicate of like what could be better what did you see during our bridge uh during my bridge being tested uh and i'd be more than happy to go over particular parts of the bridge or just general bridge design i am always available to discuss that. That's great, Michael. All right, I think we are ready to test Alex's bridge. All right, we hit start here. My two hand And here we go. There's lots of crackling going on there, and you can see that reflected in the load displacement plot. Um, that is the lower cord separating from, you can't see it, I think, because it's on, it's closer to me, but the diagonals are separating from the lower cord. Oh, now you can see it. Uh, so the verticals and the diagonals are separating from the lower cord, but actually the floor system, despite what I said, is, uh, is, is hanging in there. It has not failed. So all that cross bracing is doing a really good job in keeping the load nice and even between the trusses, not a lot of lateral um, out of plane movement. And that lower plane is really holding together. So the craftsmanship is good. Um, and that is the load path now. So basically this this bridge no longer thinks it's a truss, it thinks it's just one single plane um, on the bottom here, that, that, that plane of the floor system and the lower cords, um, that's how the load is primarily getting over to the support. So not a lot of strength, but um, perhaps that gives us a lot of time to get off the bridge, right? So that's great. Uh, good job, Alex. Uh, 49 point four four. And I would say this is an example of the phrase of the the weakest link in a chain. And you can see that coming through in bridge design of, uh, you can see most of the bridge is intact. It didn't go through the top and bottom cord, but the connections itself uh, led to uh, loading, not being able to transfer to all of the bridge. So then it just, uh, held loading with one portion of the bridge instead of all of it. So this is an example of connections breaking compared to the wood itself.
no need to switch the screen. But thank you again to our lovely sponsors. Woo! Companies! Uh, but I will say, uh, definitely, if you pursue civil engineering uh, in the future, um, I still remember that the first handout I got from any engineering firm is our wonderful sponsor who's still with us, KCI. Uh, I got a wonderful one piece coaster puzzle, uh, or it was interesting. It was a one piece puzzle, which I had not heard of before, but basically you just had to align all the different parts. But I still remember that. And during my uh, recruiting in college, I kept that in mind. I actually knew a company. Uh, so thank you to our lovely sponsors. Uh, and I think that's all I have to say. Uh, if anyone's viewing a recording in the future, hello, the future, uh, but always consider donating uh, to anybody who's considering this as a company in the future. Is uh, Catherine from Lead for the Future Academy. So Catherine has an arch bridge as well, as we saw, uh, I think, bridge number two. Awesome. So this one's different, though. It has a different um, the cusp system here, a bracing system, whereas the, uh, the second bridge was a radial system of braces. Um, this one is, does feel much more like a truss. Um, and so we have uh, vertical members, diagonal members that are going to be experiencing uh, extension or compression depending on where uh, they are located, um, and a, a, an arch here which is going to be in compression. So Catherine, um, I know that uh, you don't have lateral bracing between your two um, your two arches or your two uh, trusses here, whatever you want to call them. Um, so we'll keep an eye on the, the lateral uh, movement of your bridge as we, as we load it. Um, but it's, it's beautifully done and the, the floor system is really nice. I think there'll be no problem getting the load into uh, these, these uh, trusses or arches. Okay, so it is in position. I'm going to hit run and we will start loading. Here we go. a nice uh, initial response there. You may have been able to see it from this uh, top view camera here, um, but a little bit of lateral displacement going on. Also this top arch, this is in compression and it is about to buckle because um, it is, oops, yep, just so the back one buckled, the front one's thinking about it, or perhaps it has, because it has at the middle. Um, and that, that force was just too much to overcome the strength of your glue joints here. So those, those failed. And now the strength really depends on the lower core here. Um, that's the, that's the load path. But you can see there is still a little bit of strength. So that's great. Take 
centimeters like the others. Um, so it looks like the lower form may also have just failed. But that's about it. All right, good job, Catherine. So Catherine, um, again, really good job. Um, the, I think two things that, that you could think about doing, and I know you're uh, wrestling with um, you know, the efficiency at the same time. Um, so just that, that's a, a game of, of balance that you have to play. But um, oh, maybe a little bit of lateral bracing between these two sides. Um, and, and the arch, uh, because it's going to be under compression, um, the single member here would, would probably be better if it was laminated into maybe a double member. Um, you, you sort of have that with the lower cord, although the, lamp, the two pieces are separated, um, but the arch could use that as well. So again, it's a trade-off in terms of weight versus um, strength, but, um, but it might be something to consider because the design is really nice. Good job. Something that I've liked that I've seen with the competition so far is we've seen a lot of different failure mechanisms. Uh, so we've seen a top cord break there. Uh, we've seen connections break along the bottom. Uh, we had <coughs> localized uh, buckling. We've had uh, global buckling. Uh, so a bunch of different examples of all the different things uh, as you ramp up your knowledge of bridge design, there's just more and more things you can consider. Uh, so with increasing complexity, you can start considering more and more aspects of design uh, that once you get the fundamentals down, there's, there's probably always another thing you can worry about. Uh, and the thing that I think is fun and why I'm still very engaged and I like building bridges for this competition still is that there is no right answer. Um, you could see, I believe the video is back up on YouTube from the international competition. The two different concepts and uh, Dr. Sangri, I think I have comments or questions of, I don't even know how they built such an efficient bridge of why did the top five bridges from last year's international competition work so well? Uh, but there were two different concepts of Oregon bridges made use of laterally pushing against the walls. And then uh, people from Nevada just had a very interesting uh, tight truss that ended up being very efficient. So there's no one right answer. And you can see all the different things from our competition so far, how many different ways bridges can fail and different things to consider. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a really good point about design, right? It's not there's not one right answer. Uh, there are lots of ways to approach it um, and uh, just you know, keep those, those goals in mind of efficiency. And um, when you get out there and you're you know, designing for company, um, economy, for sure, um, which sometimes goes hand in hand with efficiency. I mean, you also want your bridge to look nice, right? You want the public to enjoy.
enjoy um, traveling uh, over your bridge. And so um, elegance or aesthetic is also really important. And um, we've seen a lot of great examples of that. Um, so we have Samantha and Bridge. Uh, Samantha is from We for Future Academy. Um, so really nice, um, simple trust, parallel cords, and diagonal members, again, a worn type. So there's going to be a, a mix of tension and compression. Um, some, um, I haven't pointed this out, some of the other bridges have had this as well, um, but there are uh, built up connections here between the diagonals and the cord members. Um, we might call those gusset plates. Um, if we were looking at a metal truss, um, but those are nice, those should, should, should provide some extra strength. And super strong floor beams. So there's no way that those floor beams are going to be the first thing to fail. Uh, those are going to get the load to the truss without any problem. Uh, I think I can guarantee that. All right, so we're going to put this in place. Trying to make sure the loading plate is evenly placed um, on two floor beams and that the bridge is relatively evenly supported on two abutments here. So to do that, I'm starting out with a little initial load, but it'll be captured by the, um, the data acquisition system here, so it'll be all right. And, all right, Samantha, here we go. All right, nice, quick response. Um, I'm going, I think that's the diagonal members separating from one of the cords. It's a little bit hard to tell. I think it's probably the lower cord. Uh, no, so um, these diagonals in the corner separated from the top cord, and this one as well. So of course we're loading this. If you're keeping track, we're loading it slightly to this side, right? My my right, um, which means that this side of the bridge is uh, having to carry more load than than this side, and so that's why all the failures have been concentrated over here. Um, so our lower, your lower cord though was laminated and was looked really strong. It actually uh, failed right here. And then the diagonal members, uh, one of the compression diagonals uh, failed in compression, so it buckled. And some of the other ones failed uh, because their glue joint uh, failed in tension. And so the truss that's closer to me is really having a hard time. That load sure wants to get to the front truss, which is in a little bit better condition, though. Just a little. Oh, and I think we're through. All right, so your max load is 104.72. Uh, good job.
So I think something I haven't pointed out yet, but um, Samantha's bridge gives me an opportunity to, is um, the orientation of these diagonals, if, if we were loading this bridge right in the middle here, um, what that would mean is that these diagonals that are angled away from the center here, those are going to be in tension. And then these diagonals are going to be that are sort of creating triangles this way, um, upwards pointing triangles. Those are going to be in compression. So um, originally when um, builders were designing uh, wooden truss bridges um, or, or wooden roof trusses, they would keep their diagonals uh, primarily in compression, so oriented this way, because these joints, um, these glue joints, of course they wouldn't have used glue, but, but you can see in this, in this situation, these glue joints are really hard to create um, a tension joint uh, that has as much strength as, uh, as, as the member. Um, and so um, they would rely more on compression numbers than tension numbers. Um, and so you can kind of see the difference on, on this side of those members, what happens when they fail in tension versus compression. Uh, the tension members here uh, separated up here at the, at the glue joint because it's trying to pull um, and, it, and that's the easiest way for it to separate. The glue is it's weaker than the, the member itself. And the, this member here, which would have been a compression diagonal, let me see, yeah, <laughs> almost looks like a vertical there. Uh, a compression diagonal um, would be in compression, so it would buckle. And so again, you can imagine in compression, you have really thin stick, and you're pushing on it, and it's going to first bow and then right, break. Um, and that's what's happening to this, this compression. Um, but at least it's depending on the strength of the member, not the glue joint, um, which is a little bit easier to, to design. So, uh, but good job. You kind of wrecked your bridge, but it was a nice one. And this is our last bridge. And we're going to see if we can get it tested. I think this will be one of my favorite moments of the day watching one of my former professors trying to finagle something. And for the record, uh, I all of my wood design knowledge comes from Dr. Sangri. Uh, 
I took one. I took a uh, master's class of wood design from her. So I could also blame all of my wood knowledge on her as well. If we have any clips, uh, you know, breaking that piece. This is just the peanut gallery just commenting. I'm sure I'm totally helping. And again, thank you to our lovely sponsors. Uh -huh. So, so I can get it, you can get it in there. But can you get the wing nut? The wing nut's gonna be tough because the so the rod is just adjacent to the yeah. Can you see that in the screen here? This member, and I can do the plate kind of diagonal. Um, what that means is the wing nut's gonna be doing the work. So it's not ideal, probably. So we can we can try that or we can flip it. Oh, uh, I don't know if Devin's on the audience, but I would say clip it. Devin is in the audience. Devin, if you want to chat, um, let us know in the chat what your preference is. We can either clip it or um, just kind of finagle it so the wing nut's holding more of the weight. Just let us know what you prefer. Eventually, what's going to happen is we load this is this piece is going to fail anyway. Um, and then and then the wing nut will go against the be flat against the plate and then the loading of the whole bridge will begin. So maybe it is better to clip it in the Yeah, case. that's what he was saying. Uh, clipping from those two parts we have. I think I remember like oh yeah, like there. We typically leave this uh, day of fun uh, for the competitors themselves, uh, but I think it's also fun to have this recorded uh, for the future of this surgery. <laughs> she's scrubbed in, she's got her, look at those steady hands. Sorry, Devin. <laughs> <It's so terrible. laughs> Got the red wire. The red. <laughs> and uh, as Devin said, uh, I'd be more than happy to reweigh this after we're done from, you know, it's going to totally be less weight now. Do you want to reweigh it now? Because it can move. Oh, because it might fly around. Uh, yeah, pieces could fly around. I think that would be if we can get it back out. I can get it back out. Um, like sadly, this is all oh. very interconnected, right? So now that I've clipped this piece, this is quite. This is not going to be doing anything. So support. So we'll be relying fully on the bottom truck, which is still substantial. Um, but I. And because this is unofficial, so we can kind of do whatever we want to do. I don't know if you'd recommend removing this in terms of weight because it's really not doing anything. Else. I just <laughs> yay! <laughs> it's more efficient. Eleven point seven. And another rule that is rarely applied, but 
we were seeing with how we needed to wedge things. Uh, it does say in the rules that the uh, this uh, loading block has to have parallel edges going along the longitudinal plane. So that is something for competitors that might uh, participate in future years. Uh, make sure you don't depend on twisting this uh, plate it has to be, as you can see it, not rotated in any other angle. All right, there we go. Um, we got computer running, and we're going to. Okay, so, a pretty nice uniform response here. Uh, one of your diagonals popped out there. Um, would be one in compression. And the lower core became separated from uh, this, well, the, the braking system there at the other end. The loading plate is also split, so it's really only loading the, the tracks here in front. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind, um, just in terms of when you're thinking about the limit um, to uh, Maybe make sure you don't cut it too, too close where the, the loading plate can split because that uh, will make your bridge not perform as you intended. It's a little bit narrower, um, maybe better. But even without that bracing system on the top, it reached 49.43 newton, so that's great. And And the lateral bracing system on the bottom, I think, was um, enough to keep it uh, moving in a, in a nice vertical plane. Oh, and that's it. So good job, Devin. I suppose flipping that top number was nothing compared to what we just did do it by putting <laughs> 50 uh, newtons of load in it. So I believe uh, someone over there, I, maybe Jessica could confirm, uh, we are looking to uh, break for, we're going to say at least 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes to make sure we have everything right. Uh, we decide on all of the awards and then we'll be making announcements for each of the five awards we have, starting with uh, mentor excellence, then the architectural award, then third, second, and first place. And then we'll have closing comments, if any, and then we'll be good for the day. Uh, was there anything I missed from anybody over there? Nope, it sounds great. Um, so I would, I would recommend all, um attendees to stay in the webinar. We're going to leave it up um, and we'll be back very shortly. So if you want to take a bathroom break or get some a snack, um, then we'll be back to announce the awards. Okay. Thank and you, everyone. Excellence Award. And this year, I'll be giving it to uh, Feng uh, from Le uh, Lead for the Future Academy. I have really appreciated uh, his input. Um, I have definitely appreciated him being 
constantly in contact, available, uh, always asking questions. And I felt like he's been there to support his students this year. So we'll send him uh, that award and be in contact with him to send that. Uh, thank you for your participation this year, Feng. Uh, it's been great to have you and your students this year. So the next award is our architectural award. Ooh, and we'll actually, if possible, we could we have Nicole announcing this. Uh, we had some lovely different designs. There it is. Okay, so we have them like that. All right, well, I picked um, bridge number one, which we can put on screen here. Andrea's bridge, very well constructed, not crooked at all, or at least it wasn't when it was originally <laughs> made. <laughs> uh, very nice symmetry. It looks really nice from all different angles. And you can see even after it's been broken, uh, the construction on it is, is just really excellent. Um, nice sanding and uh, it, it looks very good. So thank you, Andrea. Good job. Congrats to Andrea. And then we have the podium spots. So we have, it was uh, really close efficiencies this year. Uh, so we have third place. Uh, so it was close in the sense of the difference between fourth place and third place was only 8% efficiency. So, you know, having a little less on one versus holding a little more weight with the other, but in third place with an efficiency of 587, we have Samantha from Lead for the Future Academy. So congratulations. We have a, uh, oh, some applause even. Uh, some, the mass of 18.2 grams and holding 104.7 Newtons. Uh, which doing the math of that totally mentally in my mind and uh, it's uh, over 10 kilograms, but you know, math's not my strong suit. I'm only an engineer, uh, but hopefully that was about right. But congratulations to Samantha Yee. So that third place, then we have second with a dramatic drum roll. Uh, so an efficiency score of 856 uh, is from Hereford. We have Ethan. So congratulations to Ethan. Uh, second place, a wonderfully, another well-crafted design. Uh, so congrats, that was uh, 856. Uh, and that's second place. So we hope to be in contact with uh, everyone um afterwards to deliver these as well as your checks from our lovely sponsors uh and then we have first place drum rolls excitement we have josh from bridge uh rock bridge academy uh with an efficiency getting over a thousand uh so a thousand and four so congratulations to Josh for the most efficient bridge this year. Uh, wonderful use of, oh yeah, you can hear that applause. Oh yeah. Uh, so congratulations uh, for taking first. So we'd like to be in contact with those three students as well as uh, five, five people. Uh, so the first, second and third, and we have the architectural excellence as well as Fang for mentor. So thank you everyone for participating this year. Uh, definitely a hard year to participate and we appreciate it. Uh, I really enjoy this competition. I think it's great for students. I think it's great for learning. Uh, and it, in, it pushes me mentally every year to try to think for my own sake of what's the best design. And I really, uh, enjoy everyone's participation and seeing per people to participate this year 
is encouraging to me myself uh, of a hard year to do it for sure. And uh, we're happy that people could join. And we hope that uh, whatever you've seen this year, we hope to do above and beyond when we can be meeting in person and in larger groups in the future. Uh, so thank you to everyone for participating this year. Um, I'd love to be in contact with those uh, students and uh, and Fang uh, to send these uh, awards, the plaques themselves, as well as a check, uh, which will, once we get all the addresses and organization, we'll send them out to everyone as soon as we can. So uh, I don't know if people from Baltimore Museum of Industry have anything uh, to add, but just the same. Very thank you to all our uh, attendees. Thanks for tuning in today. Thank you for the students for uh, putting in the effort, especially in such an unusual year for our competition. And a special thank you to Michael and all of the other volunteers who helped us uh, put on today's competition. And I think with that, we will be closing out the webinar. Um, so we look forward to seeing you in uh, the next couple competitions we have coming up this spring. And we look forward to seeing all of our competitors next year as well with the 2022 Woodbridge competition. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of their weekend. Yep. Thank you, everyone.